last week we had just an incredible message on the sovereignty of God and how it, he kind of focused on it being looking backwards, looking back to what had happened and just a healing, wonderful, wonderful message. It was encouragement, I know, to everybody. This week it just happens, uh, just luck. That's better, that's better. You'd think a church like this would laugh at something like that, but... Uh, this week, we're, we, it just so happens that uh, sovereignly God has set it up that this is a week where we study sovereignty in terms of our future. How do we handle our future? Does our future really settle underneath God's sovereignty or not? And that uh, is a very serious issue. So I'm grateful for what he had to say last week, and I hope that this kind of fits in and carries it on so that it fills out the full of our lives as we think together. So let's stand together. As we look at Esther chapter 2, verses 19 through 315, we'll look at the challenge of God's sovereignty in our daily lives. You deal with sovereignty every day of your life. Even though you may be a type of person that says, nah, I don't like doctrine and thinking about that kind of stuff. You have to. You have to. So let's look at what the story tells us t today as we finish up chapter 2 and then look at uh, chapter 3. And when the versions were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done when under his care. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's officials from those who guarded the door, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. But the plot became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Now when the plot was investigated, he found it to be so. They were both hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was when they had spoken daily to him, he would not listen to them, that they, t they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew." When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed uh, down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. But he disdained uh, to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews and the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, Per, that is the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of our kingdom. Their laws are different uh, from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's uh, laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasure. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The silver is yours, the people also, so do with them as you please. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the uh, 13th day of the first month. And it was written just as Haman commanded to king's satraps, to the governors and uh, they were, who were over each of the provinces and to the princes of each people. Each province according to his script, each people according to its language, being written in the, same, in the name of the king Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent to courtiers, to all, by couriers to all the king's uh, provinces to destroy, to kill, 
and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. A copy of the edict to be issued as law in every province was published to all the peoples so that they should uh, be ready for this day. The couriers went out impelled by the king's command while the decree was issued in Susa, the capital. And while the king and Haman sat down to drink, the city of Susa was in confusion. You may be seated. It is one thing for us to agree with the sovereignty of God and that truth. It's another thing to believe it. And it's something we have to be very careful about as we function as believers. To believe in the sovereignty of God changes how you view God drastically. It takes you from here to here. To believe in the sovereignty of God changes how you view yourself. It changes how you view evil. It changes how you view world events. It changes your world view. It changes everything about you. And so when you believe something and you truly get it and your heart grabs a hold of it, you're changed and you're never the same. And I don't care what it is, but especially today when we're talking about the book of Esther and the sovereignty of God. Now, to agree with the sovereignty of God is a different thing. To agree with the uh, uh, sovereignty of God is merely mental assent. Yeah, I know about that, and uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard about it, and, and I, I guess it's all right. Yeah, okay. And so what, what it is, the thinking fits with us, and the logic that we would apply to it kind of fits. But in, in mental assent, we, we, it, we're not changed. We're not touched. It doesn't do a thing for us. And so it doesn't fill in the gaps in our lives to enable us to live a life that is different and changed and stands in the midst of difficult times. Or maybe I agree with sovereignty because the particular church I'm going to happens to speak about it freely when it comes up in the text. And I've never really thought about it, so I just nod my head when you say, well, you believe in sovereignty. Yeah, yeah, I believe in sovereignty God. But it has nothing to do with how you live your life. We all know what that's like. We all know there are doctrines that are like that in our lives that we just, they don't affect us. And yet other people preach about them and they get all excited about it. And that's something we have to understand uh, as we grow in our, in our Christian life. And so the difference is it changes how you view God and yourself and evil as opposed to having no effect on you at all. And you're still going through life, looking to the future the same way you used to. So having said that, now in verse 17 of chapter 2, Esther just happens to be the queen now. She just fell into that just by luck, and she winds up as the queen in the Persian Empire, a Jew. And God has moved her and put her there. Verse 19, Mordecai just happens to be seated at the gate. Now, that doesn't mean he's sitting at a gate begging. He's not a, a, a person who's looking for something. Uh, the gate was a building in, in Susa uh, uh, that housed all of the administrative uh, work of, of uh, the king's uh, ruling and uh, with the administration. And the people who worked there sat at the gate and they were there working in the administration just as the people downtown at the courthouse sit at the gate. They, they work in that building that has all the different aspects of, of government in it. So Mordecai was working for the government, for the king, and he worked in this building, and that enabled him to just happen to discover the plot that Bigthan and Teresh had, who stood at the front door of the courthouse and kept people out who didn't belong in there so that they could have uh, freedom to do the work that they uh, needed to do. And that just led to uh, came, uh, him, uh, Mordecai not being rewarded for what he did. He saved the king's life, but he didn't get a reward. And the reason why is so he could be reward la rewarded later in the nanosecond when it needed to happen to bring on God's work and God's direction. So what a powerful thing this is. All these things had to be in place for the story of Esther to play itself out like it does. And this is one of the facets of sovereignty that you and I have to really get a hold of. 
And that is that every second of our lives is preparation for what's coming. Whether it's those times in our lives that are just so glorious and we just, we don't want to come down off the mountain and you've had those times and they're wonderful. And yeah, I don't want to go home. I don't want to leave this. I don't want to get out of this. Uh, this is wonderful. Down to the times when things kind of just are grinding out. It's daily, kind of boring. And yeah, I'm a Christian, but man, whew. And, and, and we all have days like that. We all have times like that. Down to the walking through the valley of the shadow of death. All of that is under the control of a sovereign God who sets us up for our future. And all of it is part of what we're headed for. And so what, what the deal is with us, you and I who know Christ as our Savior, the moment we got saved, we were planted down on a, I'll use a picture, a conveyor belt. And a conveyor belt is called time. And immediately we began to realize we're living in a space between the already and the not yet. And we know what has happened. And we also know that there's things coming and we got the rest of our life to live. And so we're living with expectation. The more we mature in Christ, the more expectation we have to see him and be with him as we were talking about today in, in the worship and see him and, his, and his, see his face and to stand in front of him and have him speak to us and to understand that, what a, what a great joy. And so Paul talks about this. Let's turn to Romans 8 together uh, for just a second. Romans 8, and uh, let's look at verse uh, 22 through 25. I want you to see this expectation aspect because it has to do with how we view sovereignty. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Now look, real close. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we, pers we have perseverance. With perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Uh, he's talking about the removal of the curse. But look at verse 24. How were you saved? What, 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 what was the, the focus of it when you got saved? Right into hope. You came down on that conveyor belt and you began to live your life in hope because you were looking for the expectation of the completion of your salvation. You want to get rid of this body. You want to get out of this sin. You want your relatives to be safer. You want all this stuff to happen because you're in expectation. And that happens to us because our lives are changed by the sovereign work of God in salvation. And so if we have to wait for this completion, this focus in our lives that we're looking for and expecting. Where does the perseverance that he talks about in verse 25, where does that come from? Does it come from routine, raw, boring Christianity in our lives? Does it come from a kind of a blah that says, I don't really want to think about those things. Let's just be happy and rejoice. Let's just have a good time. But this book is a serious book, this Bible. It's calling us to something greater. How do we get what he calls the eager perseverance, where we are looking forward in hope, not hoping it will happen, but in hope, a noun that is a confident, absolute surety that God is going to take care of every second of my life. And it changes the way I view evil. It changes the way I view everything that comes into my life. And I need that. I desperately need that understanding. And so... The way to get that is our view of God. Your view of God has to do with everything that has to do with living a Christian life. And so perseverance is derived from the view of God. The weaker our view of God's sovereignty, the harder it is to enjoy biblical hope. The weaker my view of God's sovereignty, the harder it is to enjoy the, what's coming, looking forward and saying, in hope, I know God's hanging on to me. And so let's take a moment and look at three very serious aspects of our understanding of how uh, this whole issue of, of sovereignty creates hope in us. First in verses 1 through 4, 
when I am really means something. When who I am really means something to me. You have to ask this question this morning. Who are you? Who are you? Let's think deeply in terms of our lives. And so the king promotes Haman uh, to the highest place under the king. And everyone who uh, works for the king in the gate was ordered to uh, bow before this Haman guy. Now, Haman is an interesting character. He's the, this is an introduction of him into the story. Haman is an Agagite. His father was Hamadatha. And uh, it's very interesting that they were from, they're from the tribe of the Amalekites because Agag was the king of the Amalekites when Saul was anointed the first king of Israel. And Saul's first assignment was what? to go and make peace with the Amalekites and just have a good time together and have a party? No, his first assignment was to go kill them all. Kill everybody, kill the animals, get rid of them, get them out of here. God had had enough of them and was judge them. Saul didn't do it. Saul brought back the king, brought back some of the animals, didn't kill all the people. And so Saul, Samuel confronted him and said, what are you doing? He said, God has taken you off of being king. You're no longer king. You're no longer going to be king. And he, he was king for a while, but God's going to get rid of you. God's going to take you out. And it's very interesting that here is a guy who has a direct interest, a direct connection to Agag, the king. And it's interesting that Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin and he didn't do the work, and so it's left to two more people who are of the tribe of Benjamin, which is Esther and Mordecai, to do the work. And so God's going to get rid of this guy because he really meant it. We're going to get rid of the Amalekites. So we got Haman now. Unless we misunderstand, the idea of bowing means that I give my life to you. You run my life. I don't run it anymore. You're in control. You take over. Now, you do that every day. You either, you either bow down to yourself, or you bow down to somebody else, or you bow down to God. We all do it. You can't escape it. I can't escape it. I have to deal with this every day. It's like everybody else. And so you above, even myself, can run my life. So everyone at the gate, they, uh, they bow. Except who? Mordecai. Mordecai will not bow. And so in verse 4, they all put pressure on Mordecai to conform. And he won't do it. He says, I'm not going to do it. He tells them he's a Jew. That's a fantastic answer. Because he was a real Jew, like Moses and like uh, Joshua and Caleb. He was really a Jew. And he held seriously the things that the Jewish people were supposed to hold. He was like Daniel. He was like Daniel's three friends. A unique, godly man. And he was a Jew. And so after a lot of talking at the water cooler and, and over cups of coffee, the people in their offices there at the gate, they're starting to talk about this guy, Mordecai. What, what, what's the deal? How come he's not? And so, so they went and they told Haman that he wasn't bowing down. And they wanted to know if him being a Jew was the reason he didn't have to, they didn't have to bow down. They wanted to see if his story would really f work. So they told Haman, well, it's a difficult situation. Haman gets ticked off. And so we wind up with Mordecai having two things that he faces. And they're two things that you and I have to face every day of our lives. First of all, the world's desire to redefine who you are, and secondly, the desire that we have to bow in fear. The world's desire, first of all, to redefine us. You see, the pressure of those who call themselves Christians face as they come to a place where Mordecai has come, where they're faced with decisions. He's a Jew. And both titles, Jew in the time of Mordecai, for people like Mordecai, and for people like you who know Christ as your Savior, this means the same exact thing. 
It means that I am made in the image of God and I am responsible for responding and being the person that He has called me to be. And so we carry that responsibility seriously. And it's a pressure. And so when I say that I will not bow and redefine myself because I'm a Christian, what am I saying? What is really the issue here? It's very important that we understand this so we, de- we can define what's happening. First of all, I should not be speaking in terms of legalism. I should not be speaking in terms of superiority, of thinking I'm better than other people. But I should be able to take the stand that Mordecai took by saying, I know who I am, and I would come apart at the seams if I pressed myself beyond that and didn't do what I was supposed to do. It would take away my whole peace and my rest. Now, you've all had sins that you've committed that you know that's taken that away from you, where you can't sleep at night. You lose rest over it until you get it settled. I've had that. I know what it feels like to live with sin that you haven't dealt with. And all of us know what that is. This is what he's facing. He's facing this issue of not bowing, should I not bow so that I can keep everybody else happy? That's the issue. He's facing a serious thing here. And so, we have to be careful about what defines us. What defines you? Is it that you're always looking for the easy way out? Is that a joke in our family? We always take the easy way out. Oh, my wife takes all the spiritual stuff seriously. I don't. Or, I'm an excuse maker. I make excuses for myself so that I don't have to take the blame for my bad decisions. Or I'm committed mainly to protect myself above everything else. That's, that's the key to me. So I want to do those things. They define me. But that's not what's supposed to happen. The alternative is I'm defined like Mordecai by a bigger truth, by a real truth. Why would you not lie? Because it would eat your heart out. Not because you shouldn't. That'll never hold up over a long period of time. It's because of who you are. Why would you not bow to the God of immorality? Because it's who you are. You would never do that. Because your heart is so on fire to please the Lord and honor Him. So, it's ultimately who we are that runs our lives. And if you ain't something, you don't have anything to live for. And we have to begin to pick this up, especially from the book of Esther, because we see this guy rising up, not Haman, but Mordecai, and he's been challenged. He's challenged to live and be a Jew. And so the first thing is the idea of being redefined. Don't let the world redefine you because you know there's a sovereign God who's taking care of you. You don't need to redefine yourself. If you make a choice to stand, God's going to take care of you. You believe that. And then, secondly, the temptation to bow out of fear. Now, all of us have faced that. To live our lives in a given situation because we're scared to death. And so when people who worked with Mordecai told Haman what was happening, Mordecai was exposed and open to fear. So how does one defeat the fear that hounds someone like us in Mordecai's place? How do you face that? How do I face that? It's very important that we understand it. I know that people will reject me if I do what's right. I know that I'll suffer. I'll lose things that are important to me. I may even hurt other people, which we're going to look at in a second. How do I get rid of this fear? I think the Bible tells us very clearly, and I have discovered over the years of my experience, that this is absolutely correct, as of course it is. Matthew 10, verse 28. Let's turn there. Matthew 10, verse 28. What you need 
when you are afraid to make a decision to live right, listen, is a greater fear. You need a fear that's so much bigger than that fear that it will make that fear just disappear like breath out of your mouth on a cold day. It appears and it's gone. Of course, somebody wants to kill you. You have some fear. But this fear that we're going to talk about here is the fear that we need to understand. So what's it say in verse 28? And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, what's the comparison? Who's the strongest? The person who can kill you or the person who can assign your soul to hell? Yeah, the one who can assign your soul to hell. All right, don't fear this in the sense of, of it controlling you. Of course, somebody standing in front of you with a sword, you're going to have some reaction. You know, just say, oh, well, uh, uh, go ahead. But what I'm saying is it doesn't control you. It doesn't make you do something you shouldn't do. That's, that's the point of this whole thing. And so when we talk about fear, we're not talking about fearing God. We'll, well, we're afraid of Him or that He will abuse us or He will mistreat us or He will take us and, and be, uh, 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 break the law with us and treat us in a very bad way. That's not what we fear. As a matter of fact, the book of Proverbs defines the fear of the Lord very well for us in five different places. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So any kind of education we have, it's all general revelation when we study the sciences and all that stuff. And it all starts with the knowing God. The more we know God, the more we love the study of general revelation, which we call an education today in our society. Uh, Proverbs 10.27, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. 14.26, it's a strong confidence, the fear of the Lord. 1427, it's a fountain of life that springs up toward us. And then Proverbs 1923, fear of the Lord leads to life. That's a pretty serious thing. That, that's telling us something about the fear of the Lord. I hear many people say, I don't believe in fear in the Lord. Well, because you don't understand what the Bible is saying about fear of the Lord. We're not afraid of Him. We know He won't abuse us. So, so you can wipe that out. It's a biblical view of fear, and that needs to be studied and looked at. So not bowing to a wrong God is wrapped up in who I am. It's part of who I am. And to refuse to be redefined due to my view of God and to not bow down because I fear God more than I fear those who could hurt me. Now, that's a tough adjustment for us if all of a sudden tomorrow things start to be like they are in Iraq or Iran. But these people grew up with it. They're used to it. We're not. But the same, the scriptures apply to them and they apply to us. This is something for us to really keep in mind because we live expecting, we're looking forward in our lives. Okay. So verse 5 and 6 then speaks about when others pay for our choices. Verse 5 and 6, we have now uh, Mordecai has to face the fact that his people are in trouble. The Jewish people are in big trouble. One of the hardest jobs of the, the President of the United States, according to President Bush, the second one, is when he has to uh, call people to war because he knows the decision of one man is going to affect millions of people. And he has to make that decision. He said it's, it's a destructive decision. It's a horrible decision for the inside of a person. And uh, so that's a hard thing. And uh, here in our story, Mordecai, Mordecai has made a decision due to the fact that he's a Jew. He's decided to stand for God, and now all of his people face distinction. Or extinction, not distinction, extinction. What a, what a powerful thing. Five and six tell us that Haman was so mad at Mordecai that he chose rather than 
just killing Mordecai wanted to kill all the Jews. Why do you think so? I'm sure he has some knowledge of what happened under Saul. That's why he was an enemy. They were enemies, ultimate enemies. And so he went, when he found that out, he didn't know that these people were Jewish until they told him, because Mordecai said, keep, keep it secret, told Esther. And now he gets the full picture, and he is tanked up and ready to get even. So Mordecai faces a lot of pressure now. And so you see where he's at. He's made a decision to stand. All of his people now are going to possibly be killed because of his decision. How would you handle that? How would you handle that? Would you back down a little bit? Would you give a little bit? Serious question. There are two principles to guide us in Scripture. Matthew 10, 37, which is right near where we were just a moment ago. Matthew 10, 37 says, put this paper in here. What's in here? Ah. Listen to this. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That's a tough one, isn't it? I keep going. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so right in the context, look what he says. Look at this. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. See how he connects not loving somebody more than God with a cross you have to bear? He puts that together. It's a serious, serious issue. And so notice the context. It's a powerful context. The cross speaks of death. Death of what? The death of what? Well, in this particular case, it's speaking of the death of all the things that I would worship that I would place above God, even my family. That's tough. And so it is a cross to bear to be in Mordecai's place. I can't imagine the pressure he felt. To be forced to decide and to have to decide to obey God and put severe pressure on my loved ones. To decide that my choice may cause others severe pain. So who do I love more than God? Who have I put before God? What have I put before Him? And the way we understand that, the way that happens is this. I don't take the study of doctrine and the, and the Word of God seriously. I bail out by saying, oh, I'm not the kind of person who likes that detail. Well, it's here for a reason. Everybody's not an R.C. Sproul, but everybody has a mind. Everybody has a brain. And I assume all of you got through high school. And uh, so you can think. And, and, and th but this is a cultural thing that, that has come upon us since uh, the 60s. This whole idea of elevating the idea of not getting details because that just gets in the way of Jesus. No. It builds up Jesus. It supports the truth of what we believe. The more we study and the more we learn. And so, Mordecai it was willing to refuse to bow at the risk of the extinction, uh, extinction of his people because of who he was. Beautiful. He was a Jew. You're a Christian. Same thing. And secondly, choices reflect what I believe about consequences. When consequences control my choices, this is very serious, then I am trapped. You see that? When consequences control my choices, I'm trapped. I'm very trapped. And I'm in a situation where I have to choose what protects me rather than what's right. And I'm in a bad situation. 
It takes away my freedom. It takes away my ability to make choices. And I'm really concerned about how it's going to affect other people. What a trap that is. See, Mordecai faced that. And so do you. You see, if I have to give these things up to protect others from my choosing to serve God, then I'm in big trouble. I'm a walking contradiction. I say one thing, but I'm under pressure from the world or from someone to bow to that person or that thing. And I find myself bowing to it and I'm a walking contradiction because I'm worried about what it's going to do to affect other people. Oh, this is serious stuff. If I have to give these things up, then I am a walking contradiction. Now, John Bunyan understood this. John Bunyan was a Puritan who lived in the 1600s. And in the 1600s, the Church of England uh, did a change, made a change. And they, they, they wanted everybody to, who was preaching in the churches to conform to their prayer book and to their, their service, their, their way the service was set up. Well, the Puritans said, no, we're not doing that. No way. We're not doing that. So we'll take whatever comes. Well, with Bunyan, it came stronger on him for some reason than others. The Church of England arrested him. They took him off the first time to prison for 12 years because he wouldn't do what they asked him to do. 12 years. That's not Iran or Iraq. That's England in the 1600s. Tough, tough times. And so he had a wife and he had a blind daughter. And he couldn't take care of them. And in those days, they didn't give you money to take care of your family if you're in prison or something. I don't know what they do now. But uh, that no, there's no, there's no fail-safe. No fail-safe. So what happened is he tried to make shoelaces so that he could do what? He made shoelaces so he could give them to his family so they could sell them and make a couple of pennies each day. And he had to do that. And so they came to him and they said, John, if you just change, just conform, we'll let you go back to preaching. We'll let you go back take care of your family. You can take care of your wife. You can take care of your little daughter. Give her what she needs. Just conform. And he said, no. What would you do? I know. That's a hard one, isn't it? He wouldn't step beyond who he was. And it broke his heart. He cried until he had no more tears. And if he hadn't had the opportunity to write Pilgrim's Progress, it probably would have never been written because he wrote it while he was in prison the first 12 years. And then he was let go and arrested again later for seven years. He understood this. What do you believe about consequences in relationship to decisions? Do you believe they exist to be avoided? Or do you believe they are part of living a life based on the absolutes in a world that is allergic to truth? Is that where you're at? God help us to grow in this. Some people betray themselves by the decisions they make. Have you ever betrayed yourself? It feels awful, doesn't it? Where you've made a decision and you know it's wrong and it's, it just tears your heart out. It's because you've been changed. You're different now, you see. Some people make choices just to keep other people happy. Oh, what will they think? What will they think? And God says, don't do that. He's not being cynical. He's trying to help you. Help you understand. So these are the times when, like Mordecai, must face uh, who they really are. Who are you really? Are you really, really convicted and put in a place in your life where God's above everything else? And it's easy here because we, we, we will lift each other up and we're encouraged and built up. But it's not easy out there. It's not easy when you could lose your loved one or somebody may not like you. Or it's tough. So let's look at the rest of the chapter of chapter 3 
And let's see how important it is to stay true to who we are. So when my resolve is tested, uh, let's, uh, let's look back here at uh, these verses, 7 through 15. In the first month, which is the month's Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, per, that is, the lot was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is, the month of Dar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasures. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The silver is yours, the people also, to do with them as you please. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and it was written just as Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors, and, the over, uh, and those who were over each province, and to the princes of each people, each province according to its script, each people according to uh, its language, being written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. And letters were sent by courier to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children. Sound like what happened with Amalek and the Malachites? Very similar. Uh, women and children in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. A copy of the edict to be issued is law in every province was published to all the peoples so that they should be ready for this day. The couriers went out impelled by the king's command while the decree was issued in Susa, the capital. And while the king and Haman sat down to drink, the city of Susa was in confusion. So this all takes place, most commentators feel, about between five and seven years uh, after Esther is elevated to queen. And the lot was cast to see which day Haman was going to do this to the Jews, and it fell on the twelfth month. What's cool about that? This, the, the lot was cast on the first month. It gave them a year to work this out and to figure out how they're going to handle defending themselves and what they're going to do. They, God didn't need time, but He gave God time, so to speak, through a human aspect to work with countermanding this. And so, by God's sovereign hand, this turns out that they have this year. And Haman gives about $20 million, 10,000 talents, to the king to go ahead and carry this off. He's buying his way into it. And the king gives him the money back and says, go ahead, you use it for your purposes, for what you want to do. And uh, uh, you, here's my ring. You can use it to send letters in my name. Go kill these people. So the king just kind of dismisses him and uh, doesn't even ask why, doesn't say anything about it, and he finds himself making a stupid decision. So the scribes are sent for, papers are sent, and everything is decreed and set up for that day, a year from now, when everybody's supposed to kill all the Jews that are in their vicinity, wherever they are. Remember, he had 127 provinces that he ruled over as king. So things are heating up for Mordecai. His resolve is being pushed to the wall. So what enables me to stay the course when my resolve is pushed to the wall? How, how do I stay there when the chips are so high, the, the amount is so high that I have to ante in that I am scared and I can't do it? How do I function? Well, Mordecai was a Jew, and that meant something to him. Something more important than anything else in his life. We have to get this straight. It demands a correct view of God. The only way you can stand under this kind of pressure is when your view of God is correct. 
if it isn't correct, if you don't believe that he has every second in control in your life, if you really don't believe that and don't, don't want to study it and learn it, then you're, you're headed for kind of mundane uh, thinking. You have to keep this in mind. He is sovereign over everything. And we have an eager perseverance, Paul called it in Romans 8. Eager, we're eagerly looking forward to what's coming. We're looking forward to being like Christ, to touching Him, to holding Him. I think all the time about my wife being in the Lord, presence of the Lord. She just took off. Bless her heart. You can laugh. I'm so glad for her. I look forward to that day. She was taken off the conveyor belt. She could just look. <sighs> Probably having lunch with R.C. Sproul today. <laughs> they knew each other. She loved, he loved her writing, loved the way she wrote letters. So, what do we have? How useful is this statement? Well, I want to read something to you that I think is the most beautiful statement that man can ever come up with on the sovereignty of God. Now, the Bible has a better statement, but this is the Westminster Confession, chapter 3. I want you to listen to this. Please listen carefully. This is, this is where you have to get and where I have to get. Westminster Confession says this, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of His own will, He counseled Himself, did freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Do you believe that? He freely and unchangeably ordains whatever comes to pass. And then it says, without creating evil and without taking away the free will of the creature. So in other words, when evil comes... God didn't create it, but God sure uses it. He didn't create the evil for Job. He started the conversation, but he left the evil up to, to Satan, and he used that to his glory and to his honor. He doesn't take away the free will of man. When man makes a bad choice, he brings it on himself, but God still uses it, as Dave pointed out last week. So that's a useful statement for us. That's helpful for us to understand that He ordains whatsoever comes to pass. Even if it's something that you are about ready to collapse under, He ordained it. Even if it's a simple, basic grinding out the day, He ordained it. Now, if you walk like that, then what are you expecting? Boy, you're looking forward to that day when you're, you're with Him. You're looking forward to the day when you don't have any more of this trash sin hanging off of you and, and, and doing these things that are so stupid. And you don't betray yourself anymore. You can look at yourself in the mirror and say, man, by God's grace, I, have, I finally did that one right. i got stuff in my life that I just keep doing over and over. What is the deal there? Well, this is part of it. And I'm learning this too. But what is the greatest Bible verse about that? My greatest Bible view of the greatest Bible verse on this subject is Psalm 7610. Let's turn there so we can get this settled biblically. Psalm 7610. This is a mind-blowing verse. And it puts us in a position to understand our God in a way that we never have before. If you're new to this verse, let it shock you. If you're not, let it shock you anyway. <laughs> For the wrath of man shall praise thee. And with a remnant of wrath thou shalt gird thyself. Heard that verse before? The wrath of man will praise God. I love that. The worst a man can do praises God. The worst thing that can happen to you from other men will praise God. And when you have a decision to make that's going to hurt people, do you believe in their sovereignty over their life too? Or do you believe you have to fix it 
so that they're all cared for. I'm not talking about being mean and cruel. I'm just talking about can you entrust people to God's sovereignty that you make a decision for and they hurt for it, like Bunyan had to do. He left his family to the Lord, and when he was finally over all this stuff, 19 years of prison, they were still alive. And they still had a family. How can this be that the praise of God, that the wrath of man prays? Because man's wrath against God and his righteousness only proves God's plan of redeeming his sheep is light years beyond any evil man can do. The evil I did before I was saved was horrible. It's like all of us who are saved. Wretched, horrible people. And what happens? In Islam, does Allah reach down and save his people and change their hearts? Nope. How can he? He's created by man. Communist government doesn't do that for you. It's not the save all. Hindu gods, Buddhist gods, they're all created by man, so they don't have the thinking that I am God, I'm going to change them, and I'm going to give them a heart to call on my name. One of the greatest commentaries in, for me in my generation uh, on the Psalms written by a man named Barnes. And listen to what he says. He's done all the hard work and the Hebrew study and all that. I'll just give you the, the summary. <clears throat> the meaning of Psalm 76.10 is that the whole of the wrath of man is under the control of God and that whatever there is or would be in the manifestation of that wrath or in carrying out the purposes of the heart which could not in circumstances be made to promote his glory or which would do injury, he would check and restrain. He would suffer it to proceed no further than he chose and would make it certain that there should be no exhibition of wrathful feelings on the part of the man which would not in some way be made to promote his honor and to advance his own great purposes. <laughs> That's my God. And like Dave said last week, the dumb stuff I've done in the past, it's covered by the sovereignty of God. What about the future? Do you trust the future? Is God going to take care of you? What about when people come up against you? Look what it says here. The wrath of man will praise him. And that's the ultimate issue. Romans or Ephesians, Paul says it this way, that the redemption of a wrathful man is to the praise of his glory. See the connection? What a picture. So this is who I am. I'm a man whose wrath against God was crushed to powder. Crushed to powder. Which proves that the sovereign power of God over evil is what it is. That's what I was before I was saved. And so when my resolve to honor God is challenged by hard circumstances, I must believe Psalm 76.10. I must believe that. So as we leave chapter 3, Mordecai is forced to live with his decision to endanger his people. He's got to walk with it. And he carries it for a year. Because he doesn't know what the outcome will be. He trusts his God. But he doesn't know what the outcome will be. So here's the question. Is God's care for you sovereign? Or could he drop the ball in the future? Now, the way you would answer that to me may be a little different than the way you would answer it in your heart in a given situation. And me too. Every single one of you, especially heads of home, you must understand this. You must. Or you'll see everything in vain. You can't live with hope. You can't live to the future. And rejoice. 
How you answer that question is very important, which in turn will affect the way you would choose if you were in Mordecai's boat. So the doctrine of God's sovereignty is not a doctrine to fight over. It's not a doctrine to reject and say, I'm just not an academic person. You don't have to be an academic person. God doesn't make your spiritual growth dependent on being academic. Throw that out the window. Get rid of that talk. Throw it out. But it does give me something. It's a, it's a doctrine. It's a truth from another world. And it's been injected into our world, so we have something to hang on to. It's the sovereignty of God. It's not just grind it up and, and, and just hang on. To what? That's what people tell you to do, hang on. They don't give a tell what to hang on to. Let's close with this. Turn to Isaiah 44 with me. I'll walk you through one more sovereign thing here. This is Isaiah writing about 80 to 90 years before Cyrus was born. Cyrus was the one who released the Jews to go back to Israel to uh, rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. And I want you to see what God says in, these, uh, in seven, ver seven or eight verses here. And I'll just read us through them and, and just make a comment every now and then. It is I who says of Cyrus, God speaking, verse 28 of Isaiah 44, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. Just a hundred years before he's acting. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. So that's what Cyrus is going to say, and he's saying it before Cyrus is even born. 45. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. God takes Cyrus by the hand. <laughs> Wicked Cyrus. Verse 2, I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. God makes his road to being the king easy. He just brings him right up. No problem for him. Uh, verse 4. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. I raised you up for Israel, and I blessed you, even though you don't give a rip about me. Verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising and the setting of the sun, see the purpose, that there is no one like me. He uses Cyrus, evil Cyrus, so that everyone would know there's nobody like God. I am the Lord, and there is no other. In verse 7, the one forming light and creating darkness causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Some Bibles have the word evil with calamity, but the word, the, the word create does not mean to create out of nothing like bara in the creation of the world. It's a different verb. It means to bring about, to let it happen, to let evil happen. So God does let it happen, but he doesn't create it. Very important to understand. So there is a sovereign understanding of Cyrus. Now, how would you handle that? How would you deal with that? Is that a, is that, is that a, a definition of God that makes you smile or is it one that kind of makes you suspicious? How you answer that to yourselves forms a foundation for you handle every day of your life and every decision you make is based on how you answer that question. So when who you are either means something or it doesn't, sovereignty is important. When others we love pay for choices we make to honor God, sovereignty is important. Isn't God sovereign over their life too? That's a hard one. And I don't want to sound hard, but that's, the, that's what's given to us in the Scriptures. 
Or when my resolve to follow God is pushed to its limit, I must understand sovereignty. Mordecai wouldn't buckle. How about you? How about your understanding of this? Would you? I might. I don't want to. I want to grow in this. That's my own prayer. Father, I am so thankful that the wrath of man praises you. I'm thankful that there is nothing that occurs that you haven't ordained. I'm thankful that evil comes my way because you allow it, not because you've created it. I'm thankful that you haven't taken away my free will, and yet no matter what I choose, your free will is bigger than mine. I'm so thankful that you're my God because I can trust you for the future. I look forward to the future. I look forward to the day with hope, not with fear and trepidation, not nervous and, and, and just thinking we're, we're probably going to fall apart here and my husband's going to lose his job or I'm going to lose what I've got here and this and that. To be so afraid, God, take us away from that fear. Plant the sovereignty of your being within our hearts. That, Father, we may never be shaken. And we would learn from Mordecai what it means to be a real Jew or a real Christian. Thank you for what you've given us. Encourage us as we continue together in Jesus' name. Amen.